How are you all? Uh, thanks for coming out on a blustery Saturday morning. Um, how many of you were up to Portunda when we when the visit was? Oh, good few, very good. Um, I have some bad news for you later on. Uh, good news for everyone else. Um, no, when you guys came up, I, because you know you were very good to us, we wanted to have a little uh, booklets for you on the history of workouts in Mayo. So if you have one, uh, keep that one. But I brought uh, I brought 25 copies. And for those of you who weren't up before, um, so you know it's, it's a bit like the Late Late Show. Start you off with a present uh, to warm you up to me. But um, no, I mean we do these things. I mean in life, you 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 do. Um, I was saying it to Oliver earlier on. You do. You get involved in history and heritage because you love it. You don't do it for money. Believe me. Uh, I was working in finance for 20 years in banking for most of that. Uh, I used to be area manager for ACC. And um, for my sins, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, so this is my purgatory, but uh, but it, it it breaks my heart because it, it, it's 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 uh, and I told Aileen privately it's, it's my last year in the workhouse because I had kids and unfortunately somebody has to send them to college. Um, although the way the, the way things are looking, I don't think they'll all end up going. But um, but we have to find a way of keeping people in heritage, and it can't just be those of us who love it that spend our spare time at it. Um, we were up on on. Wednesday in Dublin, and we, you know it was great for for the work we do for Heritage Week, and it's nice for ministers to come in and get a photo taken, and then it appears in the Mayo News and the Western People, and that's it. It's forgotten then, and they, that's it. I care about heritage. We need to come up with a way of keeping younger people who are coming out of college in the heritage sector because it pays for itself. It's good for us. It's part of our culture. I never understood why we think it's okay to write and your taxpayers' money, and we won't know how much really for Godwin 2020, but we don't think it's good enough to support, you know, local history societies, genealogy groups. It should just be easier to make it more accessible, encouragement for groups and gatherings to get together, a little bit of a few pounds for groups who want to travel to other parts of the country, so we get to know each other a little bit better and broaden our own knowledge. So that was the point I made on Wednesday, and uh, please God, it's... Um, that particular, uh, those particular seeds might fall on good ears. A really good guy, we're lucky to have in Galway, and you've really good people here in Mayo in terms of heritage. Uh, our hero, or my hero in my book, is a guy called Dr. Christy Kinnett, who some of you might know. He's a really good man. And um, he wrote a letter signed by some of the top archaeologists in the country to uh, the minister, uh, Madigan, in the last uh, week, week and a half. It was published in all the papers. And again, hopefully something good might come out of that, just to give a little bit more to heritage. Uh, which are huge cuts over the last 15 or 20 years. So that's my political part of my talk, uh, given. Um, the workhouse of Mayo are some of the more interesting in the country. In, in my view, the most interesting, uh, which hopefully is a lot coming from a Galway man. Uh, we get 10 in, in, in County Galway, and they're two phase. Almost all of the workhouses in Ireland are two phase, and by two phase we mean we get 130 initially, we get a secondary 33. Uh, but Mayo is unique in that regard, as those of you who were up in the workhouse uh, doesn't must know. Um, I'm going to skim over some of these, uh, so don't be too frightened by the 51 slides, because I'll stick to the 40 minutes. Alien is my timekeeper, uh, and Alien is covering an awful lot of this more in, in more detail, and more talk coming next, uh, which is on daily life in the workhouse. But, um, some of the, the, the background and the lead into why, why workhouses were deemed necessary, why the poor law, which we get for Ireland in 1838, and Britain had theirs in 1834, were necessary, are things that most of you know if you know history at all, if you have a basic understanding of what you did in, in national school. Huge population spike uh, in Ireland, um, a dependency on the single crop, I'm not going to dwell on, on much of this. Um, West Mayo obviously was, was very badly affected. And when we say dependency on the potato, what we mean is an extraordinarily high amount of the single crop being eaten by ordinary Irish people. 14 pounds of potatoes every day, huge. And it's huge, but it's not huge in the context of it's effectively all you're eating. We had a huge dependency on a single crop that no other country had to the same extent. The lowlands, which we would say are Belgium and the Netherlands would have been something like 15% uh, of uh, their diet being potato. 
in Ireland, you're looking at 85%. Uh, so you had loads of our ancestors in this room who would only have eaten potatoes. Morning, noon, night, 14 pounds a day, women, 11 odd pounds. There was very little variety in the diet in comparison to what we have now. And again, I don't want to go over ground that um, alien may be covering, but the, the logical reason for that is the, the, the huge poverty, uh, small uh, uh, crop holdings, you couldn't possibly grow grain on the same um, quality, but certainly extent, you'd need four times as much land as you probably know. So Britain passes the Foreign Act for itself in 1834. And how the British Parliament operated and how a lot of the laws we have in Ireland are modifications of laws that were passed in Westminster between 1801 and our independence in 1921 and 22. So they would pass a law for themselves called Whatever Act uh, in a year in 1800X. And the following year, a couple of years later, an act would be passed for Ireland. So we get our Foreign Act in 1834. The architect in, in the theor theological guy behind it, and again, I, do, I don't want to dwell on this, Aileen, and you cover a, a little bit of this, uh, a little bit. Aileen has done an awful lot of work on, on the two Georges, George Nichols and George Wilkinson. And Aileen, to be fair, taught me a lot um, in terms of the glib comments on Nichols that sometimes passed. And uh, in fairness, O'Connor in his book does say, um, He's hard enough on Nichols, but, but, but he does make the point that loads of people were sent before Nichols and didn't give the British government and the different uh, parliamentary committees the answer they wanted, whereas Nichols did. Um, Nichols lost his ship, didn't he, to, 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 uh, to fire? Uh, he, was in the, he was in the British Navy, yeah. uh, obviously aristocracy. Anyone in, else in his position would have probably been imprisoned, but he came from the right family. So despite losing his ship, which is a cardinal sin, uh, obviously, as, as a naval officer, uh, he was able to bounce back from it. Uh, but he did more than the six weeks in Ireland dating. He, he studied Europe as well, didn't he? Um, uh, I'm not uh, complimenting him on the introduction of the workhouses in Ireland, but uh, there was logic behind his, his, his madness, or method of madness. And this is just a quick look at the type of houses in Ireland, 41 to 51, just to give you an idea of the class of people who were greatest affected when the Great Hunger came with the Late of Life in 1845. So, sorry, a couple of you are reading that. Uh, all it's really showing is, uh, look at the decline in the fourth class of house between 1841 and 1851. And even if you accept that the census are imperfect, and we all accept that, it gives you an idea of the class of people in our society, greatest affected, as in people living in one-room cabins or hovels. That's who gets hit hardest in the Great Homer. A little uh, image. The architect of practice, <coughs> practice is a guy who I will be critical of. Um, George Wilkinson um, has designed a lot of buildings in Britain and Ireland, and he gets compliments for things like uh, Harcourt Street Railway Station, and people say, God, is it just fantastic. My criticisms of him are the facts that he, he the workhouses he built in Ireland in the late 1820s <coughs> and early 1840s, and again in, in the phase two into the late 40s and early 50s, weren't even up to best practice in Britain at the time, and how could they be? He was 24, really, yeah, when he was given the initial contract. So in other words, no, as you, you appreciate him today, nobody reaches their peak, uh, certainly in, in, uh, uh, from a professional sense, that young. And um, I think he accepted what he did was wrong. He accepted that uh, he had made errors, because despite these being government contracts, when he was beckoned, by the Board of Gardens in my hometown, La Grey, he came. And we can only presume he came because he knew that they couldn't do anything to him money-wise. He was going to get, get his payday, but that it would be damaging to his reputation. And he suggested some remedial measures. And you don't do that unless you feel yourself that what you've delivered uh, is, as I said, imperfect. Design's not up to, 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 to scratch. Particularly as regards ventilation because the second phase of workhouses we get in Ireland, um, in Mayo, and here I'm talking specifically about Belmolecure, Morris, Killala, and Newport, in Galway, Portumna, where we're based, Clinamelli, Montpellier, and Uchtarard, phase two, as we generally call them, are overventilated. <coughs> so we just checked to Tom before we, 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 uh, we were out in the, the hall in the corridor. We close over the winter months. 
obviously here it doesn't and they, they benefit from tourism all around and school groups. We have to shut because if we don't, myself and Aileen will get pneumonia. And we, we had Scarif in on Thursdays and they were very unhappy at how cold the buildings were. Uh, and it's not because they were abandoned for years, the same windows are in them as they were before. Line purging has been put in. If anything, you could make a good argument for the buildings to be warmer now than, uh, than 100 years ago. But by God, they're not. And the statistics from Galway, which I, I do a lot of work on, will show that, and particularly in Portumna, people aren't dying of cholera in Portumna. They're dying of pneumonia. So our, our infant mortality rate is every bit as high as the other workhouses, but they're dying from other uh, diseases. And our, our infant mortality rate was obviously off the charts, as it was everywhere else. And um, we learned an awful lot in, in subsequent years about cleanliness. Um, uh, just to digress for a minute, um, some of the, the, the people of a, an older vintage here would, would appreciate Dr. Noel Brown, I hope. Uh, and Dr. Noel Brown's father is from my parish. <coughs> But we're, we're having a, a debate at the moment, and I know Midwest Radio are doing it, and, and Galway FM are doing it at the moment, where we're picking the four best um, people in sport. So from Mayo, I'm sure you pick you know, four great footballers from over the years, and all other winners and so on. Uh, and in Galway, our debate is whether we should include Noel Brown, because he retired to Galway, and his, his dad was from, from Galway, but uh, he was born in Dublin himself. But, um, you know, Brown did huge work in the 20th century in terms of tuberculosis and we had a fair better understanding in the 20th century about uh, the perils of having vast amounts of people in a particular area and um, we understood particularly diet an awful lot better than in the 19th century. I mean you're still talking about a century where people believed that a lot of disease were, 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 was, was minuscule, they understood that, but they thought it kind of crawled along that we have a great understanding of, of airborne viruses. So in a lot of the, the, uh, the planning that went into some of the barracks, they would have a wall coming up to another wall, but enough for a piece of paper to, to pass between, because they thought if the guys were so small, they wouldn't be able to jump from one, the disease is so small, they wouldn't be able to jump from the wall over to the next. So we, we, we came an awful long way. Um, but th that is the major difference between the first phase and the second phase work houses. So you can see there, Bellin, Bellin, uh, Bellinet, Bellin Road, Boyle. We'll be going through, through these now one, one at a time. The background to the workhouse system, again, I think for those of you who are in Portumna, uh, we've covered this very well. Aileen is going to touch on this uh, to a large degree as well. You had a lot of evictions during the Great Hunger, during the famine. But prior to that, you had a huge amount of poverty. If people couldn't sustain themselves outside, they were paupers in the eyes of the law, your only option was the workhouse. You work inside, in Ireland you work inside the four walls for food, aliens got to discuss this, Britain was quite different, it had outdoor relief. People were admitted, aliens got to touch on this and the separation between the four rooms and their meals aliens, so sorry about that. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the workhouses of the great country of Mayo now. So, Phase one, we initially separate out the 32 counties into 130 unions. And when we say union, effectively think something very akin to our county councils today. Because it wasn't just a workhouse, it wasn't establish a, a geographic area, build your workhouse, and that's all the Board of Guardians did. The Board of Guardians had a lot to do. Half of them were elected, um, in inverted commas, and in an era where a very, very narrow select few could vote, and half were appointed. There was really no difference between the, the two types of people. Um, in reality, very often you had the major landlord at the head of the table as chairperson of the board, and in Portumna it was the Earl of Clan Rickard. And you had his minions, as we call them, rather derogatorily, but it's, it's a fact. I mean, we know the names of all of those that were there. They were the minor landlords, very subservient to Clan Rickard. George Conman Kinney, who was uh, uh, from a major cricketing family in Longford House. Heirs, if, names you guys would associate with Gaul, and he's called them Pickard. The heirs of Aircourt, the Lawrence of Lawrence Town. Um, but there was no doubting who was the, 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 the man in charge. In theory, the board were to meet once a week. Some workhouses it was once a fortnight. 
in Portumna once a month uh, if we were lucky to held it. And Ken Rickard was very rarely present. Very rarely present. In that era, a lot of the landed gentry went to the UK to avoid fear of attack and fear of a, a bit of an uprising, obviously, with the Young Islanders in 1848, and really fear of disease um, and not wanting to see, I imagine, what was in front of their eyes. So I start here um, with Ballinay. Union declared in 1840. A lot of unions were declared in 1839 because yeah. we had the Poor Law Act, of course, in, in, uh, in 1838. It's on a nine-acre site. Why is that important? The size of, of the, the, the each uh, union is important because this area here is to be used. You're inside four walls. There is to be productive work going on here. The theory being that you could be somewhat self-sustainable, grow potatoes, turnips, and so on, practice not always a reality. And the disconnect, um, if I might say somewhat like the children's hospital, the disconnect is what's possible on a site, access and understanding uh, of the implications of what you want to do on a site. Portumna is a case in point. Portumna is built on a quarry. Now, how are you going to extract agriculture, tillage, potatoes and carrots, turnips from a quarry? And of course the answer is you can't. Various efforts were made, small corner was used, and that then couldn't be used anymore because of course that's where we put our dead people. That's where uh, we have, we have a, a grave on the site. Um, you do get some success stories. Montpellier was the only success story in County Galway where they were able to produce, at their peak year, 80% of the food that they needed to sustain the place. And they got that by tweaking the rules where women were allowed out, not men, to do the tillage because there simply wasn't the men to do it. The men were there were old and infirm. So the size of the, the workhouse is important. Cost is important, again, I'm not going to dwell on that, but you can see the comparisons as we go along. The number of inmates is key, and I, what I've given you here is just a snapshot, and I include that in the little booklets as well, because bid for 1,200, um, 3,733 in, in 1848, and I could pick random, you could pick Black 47, something similar, into 49, well over capacity throughout this period. Um, but I also want you to look at the comparison by 1843, um, I, that's a figure I put consistently all the way along. I think it's around April, May 43, so you would expect fewer in there anyway. But generally, most of the workhouses I looked at in this regard had fewer, an awful lot below capacity post-1852, because people are either dead or abroad. As you know, we lose a million between 45 and 50, and we lose another million through immigration. And what, um, what Barbara, uh, uh, what I'd, I'd love to do more on, uh, and it's something I tried to do research on, but I haven't been able to pull it off, to be honest, haven't given it the time it deserves, is more on the period between 50 and 55, because we actually lose more to immigration between 50 and 55, we reckon, than between 45 and 50, because we need the time to turn on the tap. Uh, and we lose, I don't know how many more hundred thousand in, in that five year period as well. Uh, uh, you know, the, the fatalities didn't just stop 1850. Um, Ballon Robe declared in 1839, again, an earlier one, and I know Avril has, has a, the minute book here from Ballon Robe, and uh, she's she did obviously done brilliant work in, in Ballon Robe. We have only one book out of Protumna, unfortunately, uh, but Galway County Council have done a little bit of work, clearer, exceptional, and temporary are good, uh, and I know Mayo have, the County Council have, have tried to do stuff as well, and it's a case of digitizing what we can before it lasts forever. I'll tell you a sad story about one workhouse briefly in, in, in Galway. I won't name, name it because you may know people down there. But it's in, let's just say it's in the south of the county. And the minute book and the admissions books are held by a lady in the attic of her house in this particular town, in black bags. And there's a wonderful nun in Kiltartan who uh, was allowed access to it. And afterwards, the lady put it back into the bag and threw it back up the attic. And I think that's very worrying because when she dies, or if she dies in the next few years, maybe her kids won't know what the hell it is, maybe they'll throw it out. But if you, at least if you give it to the council or the National Library, you might have some chance of getting it digitized. Um, and here in Ballon Robe, you see, built for 800, and well over capacity in 1848, and again, we have the divisions uh, broken out. And you see here, you're going over county boundaries. So you have Ross, uh, which is um, an awful lot of Clambor, um, 
kind of work people who are my, my uh, family live as well uh, would be sent to Balanovas in nearest workhouse. And it's why I include Boyle. Um, obviously, in Mayo, you, 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 you take in Boyle as well. Um, and again, declared early, 39, capacity 700, and not that much over in 1848, but over capacity nonetheless. Um, you're quite unlucky in Mayo as well. Um, we're probably luckier in Galway with the ones we have surviving, because obviously Portumna is intact. Montpellier is a secondary school, it's fully intact. Three quarters intact. La Grey is reasonably intact, maybe maybe half to, to, to two thirds intact. It's now St. Brendan's for any of you who know La Grey. If you go up by the lake, it's on your left hand side. It is a wonderful HSC facility to do uh, ears, nose, and throat for kids and to have a, a mental intellectual disability outreach place as well. And it is, of course, a nursing home too. Um, Castle Bear, again, most of you know the HSC were effectively given most of the workhouses uh, in Ireland. Uh, so that's why you've generally hospitals on site now. Uh, again, an early workhouse declared 39, uh, not open till 42, but uh, again, 1500 in, in there in 48, and again, the areas you can see the HSC facility there. This is the most interesting part of County Mayo's uh, uh, workhouses is the construction, but um, you know, neglect, uh, not being able to find the money. In the Galway situation, we had our infamous Archbishop in Tune refusing to pay the poor rent, saying he'd look after uh, the poverty and tomb his own way. We had huge problems collecting the poor rent. Every workhouse west of the Shannon goes back up to some stages, you guys probably know. But the shame for Galway is we opened Clifton on a Tuesday or Wednesday and we shut it a day or two later. Twice in 18 months, the, the door was shut on Gart after it opened. Gart was very good at actually manufacturing, but you would literally bring in people you would realize you had enough income to come in to feed the people that are in there. And you would send out all the people again and set everything up at the workhouse. And that cycle continued in Galway with, as I said, Gart and Clifton being the two worst workhouses for that in, in, in my own county. Casserie was declared in 39. We have um, a workhouse completed in 42 and left there for four years. <coughs> uh, so Mayo gets this mid-phase of other uh, counties don't experience, certainly not to the same extent, uh, capacity a thousand, and you can see why they panicked and opened it in 48, or why they had to find money and were forced to open it in 48, it's at three times capacity. And these are just figures on a page I made it here, but if buildings are constructed for 1,000, trust me when I tell you, 1,000 is all they can hold. Um, but you've 3,000 people squashed in there together, the infirmaries are full, People who should be in the infirmary then aren't in the infirmary, they're in the general populace. So you're just spreading disease, you're, 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 you're inviting the disasters that was to come. <coughs> and we've had the workhouses um, could be studied in a lot of different ways. It could be studied by looking, all of you I know love, uh, uh, Din from Dinnan love genealogy. And go on and look at the petty sessions that are available on Find My Past. Look at the petty sessions for the different towns. Don't key in workhouse if you like, but it's better to key in union, whatever union you're researching. And look at the amount of cases that workhouse masters are taking to court people in the workhouse. And they're taking to court because people are probably fighting at times, because they're squashed in together and they're, they're at their wit's end. And the, the, I always quip that the, the, you know, the European Central Bank only cares about inflation. The workhouse master only cares about money. He only cares about money. He wants to get these people very often out of the workhouse. And I'm conscious because we wrote a book last year on the workhouse of Clare, and I dedicated it to the staff because I didn't want to be painting all workhouse masters as evil. But in our research, it is worrying how many of them weren't good, even by the measure of the time. And, you know, we had the number of rapes in Bagus Law workhouse. We have the moving of blankets from the infirmary of workhouses to the general populace again and again in the same workhouse. And it's only when really, you know, diligent, good local historians do research on individual workhouses that you get, because it takes time going through the newspapers, it takes time to go through the books and try and compare the statistics. Go on, go on, on to the Enhanced Parliamentary Papers of Ireland, which is the best website you'll ever come across. I'll, I'll give you the website in a few moments. And just compare the statistics and let the facts lead you. And 
It's a horror show very often. And uh, there's a really good book on, on Scarif Union Workhouse that came out last year by a historian called Ger Madden. And Ger does simple things like uh, look at the income and expenditure. Let's look at how much food is brought into the workhouse in a particular year. <laughs> Divide the amount of inmates that we know are in the workhouse that year because we have we don't have the admission books, we have the land parliamentary papers that gives us a run in total of the figures at different times. And when you divide one by the other, they're not getting the, the diet that alien is going to touch on in a few minutes. They're not even getting what they should be getting. So that is frightening. Um, and there's, there are plenty of workhouses we know that never tried to produce agriculture. They never tried to produce crops in there. They had their agricultural schools. But the land wasn't used to the it should have been. Um, and the defense of some of the masters might be the opening of time of crisis. And they just had the numbers were too large. But they certainly didn't fulfill the criteria that were set out and the goals that were set out to achieve as workhouse guardians and as workhouse masters. Next is Swinford again early enough, 1840. And so first phase opened uh, in 46, again four years after it was completed. Um, and again, uh, well over twice capacity in 1848. And find a fine big site, I suppose six acres similar to ourselves. Um, some of the, the workhouses open in towns found themselves cramped. They were sometimes left with four to five acres to play with. So not really enough to, to grow the, the amount of produce that you'd need. Um, so that's uh, that's Swinford. Um, Westport, of course, again, and, and plenty of tough stories out of Westport uh, that I've come across over the years. Declared 1840, site on seven acres. It was initially planned to be for 1,300 that uh, people don't realize the money wasn't there to deliver that. Now, Gray was actually planned for 600, uh, but it had to be uh, uh, tweaked to be 800. This uh, uh, initially planned for 1,300. It had a capacity of 1,000, uh, opened in 1845, <coughs> despite being constructed in 42, completed fully and certified off in 42, and again, uh, over capacity from the off. Um, and this uh, officially second phase, uh, I call the other one mid-phase, uh, is the ones that are declared when we are declared. So we get an extra 33 workhouses because things are just so very bad. Hindsight is 2020, and Ger uh as a state form mentioned historian, is a big believer that we maybe could have gotten away with temporary um, housing temporary uh, lean-tos on existing workhouses. Obviously, if the authorities knew that people were going to continue to die 48, 49, 50, don't forget you have to put yourself in the period where Britain declared that the famine was over at the beginning of 1848. All done, nothing to see here. And then, of course, we get disaster after disaster in 48 and 49. Um, so, people continue to die, and people, the tap was really turned on to immigration by then, and assisted migration schemes had started to, to, to come on board, and they would touch on that as well. Uh, so that's uh, an image there of Bell Mullet. Again, a uh, seven and a half acre site, they appreciated the size of the site there. And a lot of these places have never really reached capacity, maybe immediately on opening. Opening can be a bit of a misnomer there in, in 52. And uh, the, the, the figures will show that we opened in 52, but we actually were open in 51. Uh, from when the census was undertaken, put on in 51. Uh, several hundred people were in the workhouse. And up until recently, we thought we only hit kind of around about our capacity of 600. And we had 200 for most of the 19th century, as a lot of these uh, later workhouses did. But we now know immediately we peaked well over 600. But it was just that short period between opening and the first couple of years after opening as the tide had turned. Claire Morris, uh, again, capacity of 800, uh, didn't prove necessary over time. And we do have some of Clamoris left, as those of you who know the town would know. And a fine big site as well, there, eight acres. Same in Kalala, six acre site, built for 500. And again, for most of the 19th century, uh, 100 or so people there. And by the end of the century, 23 people in there. It, not only just the And for us, and for, for a lot of the, the, the ladder workhouses here at Mayo, the, within kind of 18, 54, 55, they were petitioning it for it to be closed. They were petitioning for these to be closed because they, were, uh, they weren't they were needed. They could send people to other workhouses. Um, I've wrote the stories on the individual workhouses in Mayo if you're interested afterwards. Um, I, I, they're going through my mind now as I'm talking about, about it because I'd be critical of both churches, both religions in Ireland. 
uh, do deserve criticism in that period. And I think nowadays both would accept that. Uh, I'm not somebody who would have based the church. These are society problems. And these are religious established institutions. In the case of, of Portunga, I've only compliments to give to the Sisters of Mercy. They were absolutely fantastic. They came in voluntarily to an awful lot of workhouses, initially in, in Munster, and made their way up and did an awful lot of good. And uh, the strokes that were pulled, though, are the issues. In, in Portunga's case, uh, the local Catholic priest wanted danger money. He was a priest called Burke, and he wanted extra money because he said, look, Portunga is just a diseased building. Uh, I'm not going to do it for, I think it was 10 pounds a year. He wanted a, a big increase. Uh, and he was in his defense, and I imagine he was busy blessing the dead. Um, the stroke I'm thinking of Mayo is they would move, uh, of the other church, in this case, the Anglicans, they would move Anglicans from one workhouse to another. You were to go to your own union, as you may know. You're in a particular union. Those are the areas, the electoral divisions, currently recovered in that union. Um, initially, Ireland was a free-for-all, but after that, you had to go, similar to Britain, identical to Britain, you had to go to your, your union uh, uh, workhouse. And they would move uh, some uh, Anglican uh, people from one church to another, from one workhouse to another, so that an Anglican reverend would be appointed, salaried. Uh, so so that, that, that was caught in AO a couple of times. I think I, I mentioned it in the book as well. Um, Newport, uh, we've touched. Life of workhouses uh, during the famine um, or during the Great Hunger, again, bid for 80,000, uh, 10% of what was needed, uh, bid for 1% of the population when you had 850, odd thousand, 900,000 trying to actually get in and get relief. Um, starvation is obviously a, a, a big issue. Really, it's the, the diseases associated with the hunger in your belly that's getting it. Your immune system is shot to hell, so you're more liable to get cholera, uh, which was a major problem in the west of Ireland, uh, not so much over the 32 counties, but a really big problem in in um, in, um, in in Mayo, Galway, Clare. And I'm re reminded of the story we're talking about. Conor McMurray ran outside. I, mean, I, I gave a talk with, with uh, uh, Dr. Conor McMurray last November uh, on military history, and he was pointing out why the Spanish flu was worse among Roman Catholics than among Anglicans. And again, he would be like myself, uh, has no religious acts to, to grind it whatsoever, so I, I'm not speaking about religion, believe me. But it was a, it was a, a, a Belfast newsletter that pointed out that uh, Roman Catholics were more, um, at the time, uh, uh, committed church-going people, and therefore they were bringing the diseases with them. Uh, they were going to daily masses, and Spanish flu was passing more rapidly among the Roman Catholic faith in the, the Belfast uh, at the time than in the the, uh, the, the Church of Ireland uh, faith. Um, but again, a contributory factor to the spread of disease. Um, how are we for time, Are we okay for another? Okay, five minutes. Um, and my favorite area that I, I, I like to write on for our local uh, journal um, is the treatment of people with disabilities, um, treatment of older people, uh, and it's the thing that, you know, managing a workhouse upsets me most. The number of men in their 80s, late 70s, who were taken to court by workhouse masters, again, to go into the petty sessions, please, on Find My Past. And they are brought to court, and you're saying, what's the agenda of the workhouse master? He just wants to be feeding this guy. He's 75, he's useless. He can't, he can't walk in the workhouse. Here's a way of getting him out of the workhouse. Charge him for insubordination. Charge him for refusing to follow workhouse masters. We now know today he's not working and she's not working because she's in her 70s and 80s. Get him into the prison system, problem solved. And that is what becomes true time and time again. Um, I did a study on Scarif the year before last for Heritage Week and I found it just frightening. Found that trend just frightening out of Scarif workhouse. In this case, people with epilepsy turfed into the workhouse. People that are different turfed into the workhouse. Uh, so the highest percentages we go along the different census, and it's all available there in EPI, of the number of people in the different workhouses um, that are, are um, lunatics, asylums, and prisoners are, are covered in that. Um, decline in population of males is uh, 29%. Assisted migration scheme, aliens going to touch on a little bit, are we? No. Um, a great avenue, vacuum, release for people in the workhouse, particularly girls in their teens, was the assisted migration scheme, the most famous of which is the Arab Grey scheme. 
Amy uh, knows more and prefers uh, that topic and it knows far more knowledge about Barbara, Avril, uh, Barbara especially, uh, obviously. Um, that not, wouldn't be my specialized subject, but I, I'm so proud of the girls we sent, uh, or that were sent, if the, uh, to be more uh, appropriately said. Uh, the Tina's village outside Portona and two Nocton sisters go. Uh, one lies about Ray Jaylene, doesn't she? No way she a teenager, but that's a woman's prerogative. Um, and she and her sister sent home for their father, sent money home to the, for their father and their other sister to leave the workhouse. That's very rare. That's a wonderful story out of uh, La Grey Workhouse for people from our area. And Maria Matter, who was 14 leaving, booked the trend, became a teacher in Australia, and the, the son of a teacher my mum taught me actually, um, which she taught for 50 years, of which she was only paid for half of that. I love that. I love the fact that we had that impact in Australia. Uh, I was saying to Barbara about uh, the son of a, a band of slow woman was a fantastic cricketer in Australia. Uh, we've enough, and the amount, can think about the amount of Mayo people, we'll never understand the amount of Mayo people who went to Australia, whose sons, daughters, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are now pillars of Australian society and built Australia. We claim Keating up in the, the west of Ireland, uh, up in Tina, Paul Keating, who was a decent prime minister, I think. Um, so that's a quick look at the system migration. Uh, these are the numbers sent out in 48, 49. Uh, that's pulled from EPI, and I, that's only one of the schemes. Again, Barbara knows a lot more about that than I do. Uh, but it just gives you a number. Um, for some reason, a lock on the wild there. Um, and a lot of those girls would have been uh, from County Roscommon, as you know. Uh, but that's only one scheme. Um, so my, my, one of my specialised area is um, those who left the British Army. And I just pulled that off there. That only took 30 seconds kind of to find my past. Literally pulling down all the data that I have. Um, part of our lineage, part of our history, whether we like it or not, is the number of Irishmen serving in the British Army. We met up 40% of the British Army in the century, 60% of the British Army in India. Let's accept the bad we did as well as the good. Um, after the famine, um, uh, aliens got to wind, wind down on this. Uh, they became places for the home to stay. And I've, 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 I've touched on this. In Britain, it's easy to evolve into hospital. Easier to evolve into asylum. Awfully easy to just take the sign down and put a new sign up in comparison to here. We would not accept these institutions as hospital buildings. And what you have is newer buildings built out the front. You have, in the case of Galway, not the buildings, and build equally ugly buildings on the same site, just on a different plan. So obviously in Galway, it's where the regional hospital is. Um, but Lockray survives as the county home because in the war for independence, um, the British Army, uh, this country is awash, every hotel, Everywhere is full of British soldiers, every barracks. So the British uh, take over the mail blocks of many of the workhouses around the country and billet soldiers there. The IRA react by torching workhouses, uh, Scarif, you know, Glenamady, <coughs> and so on. And um, that hastens their, their disappearance and their, their decline. But in the eyes of some, then they were seen again in another way, they're attached to British rule in Ireland. Uh, which, which wasn't uh, something welcome in the new state. So those like in Scarty, for example, that the hospital is now on the site, only some of the buildings are really used or were ever used for hospitals. Very often it was necessary to build a new building on the front or knock everything that was there.